Hi everyone, welcome to today's uh, Q&A session on um, the Ox University of Oxford graduate applications. Um, we have with us um, four wonderful panelists who um, are pursuing their graduate studies at Oxford and will be speaking to you or answering your questions about your applications. Uh, before we start and I introduce them, I just want to let you all know that this session is being recorded. So if you are comfortable in being in the recording of the session, you can keep your videos on and you can raise your hand and ask your question directly to the speakers by muting yourselves uh, when called upon to do so. Or you, um, if you're not comfortable in being in the recording of the workshop, um, you can put your question in chat or you can send them to us as a personal message to any one of the panelists who I'll be introducing now. Um, during the course of the session, I'd request you all to keep yourselves on mute so there's no disturbance unless you are called upon to unmute and ask your question. So um, as I said, we have four really wonderful people who've joined us on Christmas Eve during a vacation uh, to speak to you about um, you know, their experience or sort of help answer your questions about your application process. Uh, we have with us Shivanki, who's uh, doing an MSc in radiation biology. We have with us Sana, who's doing a DPhil, which is a PhD in history. We have with us uh, Narhitya, who's doing an MSc in modern South Asian studies. And uh, we have Samir, who's doing a DPhil in public policy. Um, I've also... Um, I'm also studying at Oxford. I'm doing a DPhil in law, so I may be able to answer some of... Uh, those questions. Um, so yes, as I said, this, this is a purely Q&A session. We won't be giving any presentation today. Um, this is for you as you are now um, going to be applying to Oxford with a lot of deadlines in, in the first and second week of Jan. Uh, a lot of you may have a specific question, so please use this platform to ask those questions and we'll be happy to um, address them. Um, so as I said, you can raise your hand and ask your question or you can put your questions in chat. Um, or send them to us as DM. So yes, go ahead. While people warm up, could I just uh, say <clears throat> a couple of things? One is um, with Oxford applications this year, um, there are some courses for which the prompts and things have changed. So make sure that you, especially those of you who are applying um, you know, a second time or a third time, make sure that you make those changes in your documents and don't assume that the document that you used last year will, um, you know, work this year as well. Uh, the other significant change with some of the Oxford courses um, is that you don't need a CV anymore. So there's no need to waste your time on, you know, preparing your CV and formatting it and all of those things. In fact, if you upload a CV that will be removed by the system before your application is evaluated. Instead, um, what, um, what you will need to do is add, you know, on, your, um, on the portal, some of these details. They will ask you for the details, so there's no need for a CV anymore. Um, so yeah, those are, I think, uh, just a couple of things for Oxford. Um, but remember, this is only for some courses and some courses still require a CV. So please make sure that you check this before uh, you, you know, start your application. There is a question for me um, in, in chat. For the MPP essays, there are four prompts. Should we answer that format only or should the entire 800 word essay be coherent answering these prompts? I would highly, highly recommend that you break it down. Um, to those four prompts and respond to each prompt individually within those 200 words because there's an overall 800 word limit and there is um, a sub limit of you know, 200 words each for each prompt. So uh, make sure that you respond to each of those prompts separately within that limit. Um, there is, unless you know other people have questions, I have, three more questions in direct messages so I can continue yeah. answering. Yeah, I also have a few questions in direct message, but I'll let you um, ask those and maybe if anybody else wants to chip in. Okay, great. Um, so the reason for choosing um, between a DPhil, Acclovatnik, and let's say 
um, Department of Social Policy and Intervention. Now, um, so it, it, I think the, the focus of the two departments is different. Um, the, the, the social policy department that um, offers um, a defil in social policy and intervention uh, focuses more on just social policy. So it's a subset of public policy, looking primarily at social policy, make maybe you know intervention on poverty, interventions on um, workforce, labor, um, immigration, and all of those things. Um, but the public policy one is a broader one. Um, so there is definitely you know that difference in scope. And then of course, you know, for um, your defil, um, there are a number of other factors like where is the faculty member or that academic based out of that you want to work with and what would be a good home for the project that you are interested in. As someone who works on international law, uh, the social policy department is just irrelevant for me. Um, but public policy department, because they have an international law professor and an international law team that works on some of the things that I was interested in. So it was um, it was relevant for me. And that's the reason I chose uh, the DPhil at Blavatnik School as opposed to uh, social policy. But of course, you know, if your project overlaps, you can very well apply to both the departments um, at the same time um, with, you know, potentially a, a very, very similar uh, project, but keeping in mind, what do each of these programs um, focus on? The public policy one will always and always expect there to be some public policy relevance of the work that you do. And in social policy, um, it might not be the case. You might not, you know, have to justify that because it will anyway be on social policy. So, so there will be more or less some social relevance of the work anyway. Is, is that all? Um, there's some more I can take that later, but let's have others. Yeah, so there's uh, quite a few questions that have come up in the main chat and quite a few in my personal chat. So I'm just going to start taking them. First is uh, with regard to the English proficiency test. Um, do I need to provide a certificate to show that my bachelor's degree was in English? And secondly, about written work, my course requires two essays. Um, how much time should I invest in drafting the essays? Should the writing style be similar to writing a research paper or something more basic? Uh, where can I get something like a format so that I can get an idea? Anybody want to take any one of those questions? Um, okay, maybe I can start. Um, so for the English proficiency um, test, I mean, your, you will sub submit your bachelor's degree and your transcripts as part of your application anyway. Um, but when on the Oxford application portal, there's an option to ask for a waiver. So you should ideally select that option. And um, and they anyway will have um, your transcripts and they'll know that you've done your bachelor's in English. If they, they find that is sufficient for you to get a waiver, they let you know if you get an offer that you don't have to take a test. So it'll be an unconditional offer. But if they still re require you to take uh, an English language proficiency test and submit the scores, then you'll get a conditional offer and they'll say that you need to submit the test result with, uh, you know, uh, X number, uh, like a certain minimum score that you need to get. Uh, for the second part, um, again, this you need to look at the course website and see what the guideline is on the written work. Each course has a different set of requirements and different sets of guidelines of what they expect from the writing uh, samples that you submit or the written work. So again, I don't think um, what we can say what uh, you can write or what format or style it should be, but yes, it needs to be an, an academic piece and needs to fulfill all of those criteria that they list on the website of having coherence and argument, um, and all of those things. So again, um, the website is the best guidance for that. Um, then and this is a very specific question about um, something on that the application portal asks, which is, have so, um, the portal asks, have you undertaken degree level study at any institution which you have not completed, uh, excluding any qualification you are working to 
currently working towards. So uh, my family has enrolled me in a distance learning master's program within Mumbai, which is not good. It's slightly related to the field of study, but it's a little farther away. So if I get into Oxford, I'll be leaving the course. So is there something that needs to be declared? Um, I could add on to a question to a question like this. I had a similar case. I was enrolled in a degree program that I didn't eventually complete. I moved on to a different degree and then I ultimately did my bachelor's in that degree. So when I came across this question on the portal, I actually did mention that, okay, I took up this course and I didn't finish it for these reasons and I chose to move to this other degree. And I don't think it had that much of an effect on my application. Um, the, the degree that I didn't finish was somewhat related to the one I ended up finishing and that was my bachelor's degree ultimately. So I'm, I don't think it had that much of a negative effect, but I think it's good to declare these things because it might just trend in your application by showing that you are, you know, going above and beyond and doing things that may be academically beneficial to you is what I think. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, the other question is, uh, um, with respect to a DPhil at Oxford, the person state should the person statement mainly focus on my academic background, or can it be a narrative of why I want to pursue the course, plus academic and professional background? Uh, in my case, my research proposal is connected to my personal story and all other phases of life, and the word limit is only five hundred words. So, could could, could you ask them what DPhil they're applying to? It depends from DPhil to DPhil. We can go to the next question in the meantime. Yeah. Um, that's, oh my God, that's so many questions in my personal chat and in the main um, uh, chat. So, uh, okay, so there's a few questions on application fee waivers for Oxford, but just want to say Oxford does not give a fee waiver. So as of now, if you're applying in this academic cycle, if you're applying in Jan, Feb deadline to study uh, in September, October 2024, you will have to pay an application fee. The Oxford does not waive it. Uh, even if you write to them and tell them your personal circumstances, it's very unlikely that they will um, give a positive response. And that's been the experience for anyone who's applied so far. Um, but uh, the uh, relatedly, there was a question that if you apply to multiple courses, do we have to pay the application fee for all of them or would just one count? anyone wants to yeah you have to pay the application fee for the courses that you're applying for there's not just one fee great um so there's another question main chat which is my grade card is not ready but my marks are uploaded in my student profile so how do i upload them in my application any recommendations Take a screenshot if um, nothing else works. Uh, screenshot of that website and just send it. Um, because this is unofficial anyway, you will, and this is unofficial provisional, and your final offer will always be conditional on you providing the actual transcript. Um, so it's fine if you submit a screenshot at this point of time. Um, and also just to add, um, if you are able to, get that screenshot just stamped or signed by someone at the admin of your university or college or department that would also be helpful um although it's it's not uh, it's not necessary but if you are able to then it might help uh, in some way um so yeah just get it stamped and signed by whoever the admin person in your university or department is uh, then there's a question of let, let, uh, my letter of recommendation written specifically for PhD programs, but applying, but I'm also applying for master's uh, programs. So do I have to get them modified? And what wants to take that? Yeah, if I just quickly answer that, I think. Uh, 
for references, we do have specific guidelines on the websites, how references are supposed to look and what all goes into it. And I think for each program, because there are different requirements. So for instance, for a PhD program, you know, your referee, referees might want to focus on your research skills, what you did with them previously, etc., stuff like that, which tailors to, a, to the requirements of a program, which highlights your skills via V the requirements of a particular program, which might be different for, for masters. So I think you would have to get it modified because it needs to speak to the course that you're applying to. Yes, absolutely. I uh, would highly recommend that you make them as specific as possible to the courses that you're applying. Um, Could and... I very briefly as well add on this, that not just like the content, absolutely get the content changed and make it as specific as possible, but also avoid, you know, writing this recommendation for the for the master's program at your institute. Make that specific, specify the program. If you're applying for, let's say, um, a, an advanced computer science master's program at the University of Oxford, make that known right in the beginning as well as towards the end because quite often you know you get a you get an lor from your prof professor that says i am pleased to recommend xyz for a master's program at your esteemed institution and then talks about the candidate therefore i reiterate my recommendation for the master's program make it specific to what the program um, that reference relates to in addition to you know of course the content that sana talked about make sure that these things um, are specific to the course that you're applying to. Um, so um, I think there's some questions that relate to um, just what sort of things do we write under uh, different subheadings in, on the application portal. So. First is, uh, do, uh, do, is it advisable to indicate Coursera or EDX courses as part of professional qualifications and training courses? Yes, no, no. No, um, unless, you know, so even, you know, on Coursera and edX, there are courses that you actually get a certification from, not just, you know, a certificate of participation, but sometimes there are tie-ups between the university and Coursera. So Coursera is just a platform, but it's taught by a university or some institution. And quite often, these are courses that you have paid for, right, um, to get that certification. So in that case, it if it is a training related or a professional related course, you can mention, but if it is any of the, you know, um, free courses on Coursera and edX, I wouldn't uh, mention it under training courses or professional qualifications. What I would do is if, you know, I was relying on these courses to show my interest in the program or in the field, I would find a way to incorporate them in the personal statement or the statement of purpose to say that, you know, to own my interest or to in order to demonstrate my interest in this, I took up independent um, online courses, for example, XYZ, but these are not necessarily professional qualifications or training courses that should go under th uh, those things. But if you are coursework to require a CV, in which case you can, you know, put them under a courses section or something um, on your CV, um, but if it does not require a CV and you are um, you are adding professional qualifications and training courses on the portal, then I would I wouldn't include them. Um, uh, the related question is in the section on qualifications and experience on publications, presentations, etc. Is it advisable to declare research papers presented as part of the university specialized? research program at an undergrad level that were presented, defended, published within the college library. Thoughts? Um, I think if it adds in any way to the application, for example, the paper that you presented, if that in any good way relates to the program that you're in applying for, it may be a good idea to mention it because that will give the assessors an idea of assessors an idea that you are indeed interested in this area and that you've done something which shows that you are 
actually interested rather than just saying that I find a lot of interest in this area. Yes. Um, okay, maybe we should now take the questions that come from panelists. Oh, sorry, uh, audience members who raised their hands, and then I'll go back to the questions in chat. Um, Safa, do you want to ask your question? Um, Safat. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the session. Uh, actually, my question is related to my uh, Oxford application. I made my application uh, on 1st December, like uh, the deadline said 1st December, but uh, at first I was confused because I took the deadline for my course, although it was for the scholarships, the internal scholarships. So uh, uh, on 1st December, I wasn't able to make my uh, application because of the payment decline issue. And I was able to fix it by almost uh, in almost five to six days. And on 7 December, uh, my mentor made the payment through her own card. And I narrated the same issue to the Oxford team uh, before the before submitting it because I was confused with how to make payment. So they suggested uh, with some suggestions and asked if there is anything they can, I can ask them to, so I should reach out to them. Next, uh, after 7 December, I uh, requested them to consider me for the scholarships, internal scholarships, because it was due to the payment decline issue that I wasn't able to make my application on the deadline but they uh, rejected that plea and uh, said they won't be considering me for the internal scholarships. Like, is there anything that I can do? I even uh, mailed the project edu access team at the operations and programs, but I didn't receive any response. Um, I think so far the operations team has gotten back to you uh, on this, but I'm gonna check again. But if anyone has any guidance. Yeah. So we did discuss this support when we received your question. Um, but unfortunately, um, we don't think there is anything that you can do. The only thing that you can do, it might be all in vain, is for you to email them again when the office is open in January. Uh, but um, from our experience and from uh, explicit guidance, uh, from the admissions team, um, payment related issues and technical related issues are not a reason um, for them to, uh, you know, backdate your application. They might backdate it just for admission, but not for scholarships at all. So, um, in fact, like we we checked the the website and they they mentioned that these are the reasons for which they expect candidates to apply two weeks in advance. Um, of the deadline so that, you know, if there are any payment related issues or tech, tech related issues, um, applicants are able to resolve those. So my sense is that unfortunately, you will not be considered for internal scholarships, but you will be considered for admission as per the next deadline, which I think was the first of March in, on your for your course. Um, so yeah, but, but once again, uh, you can you can try emailing to to see if there is any change of heart, but I I exactly. doubt there will be. As soon like uh, as soon as I submitted that, I received a mail, and uh, they said they'll be assessing my application within four weeks. I'll receive a response, but uh, once I asked them for the scholarship consideration, they said they'll be considering me in the March session. That I didn't understand. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. I told them about uh, that I have been creating an account since November, that I started my application since November. And even I mailed you for the application fee waiver, to which I didn't receive any response as well. But uh, they didn't consider any of that. Yeah. Unfortunately, they won't because all of these things are things that they expect candidates to uh, figure out on their own on the basis of guidance that they have already published. 
Um, so on your on the first March um, deadline, some courses have two deadlines. There is a the first deadline, and then there is a later deadline. And more often than not, the first deadline is the deadline to be considered for internal scholarships. Um, now that you have missed that, you know, on account of these yeah. different circumstances, you will be still considered for admission in the university by the first March deadline. But because the scholarship deadline was the first deadline, you won't be considered for internal scholarships, unfortunately. Now, so it's just internal scholarships. What I would suggest is that you wait for an outcome from the university on your university application, and then um, you know there will be other scholarships that the programs team will also organize sessions on, like in lags and and other scholarships. So try those, and uh, let's hope that something works out. Fine. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, Jan, do you want to ask your question? Uh, hi. Uh, so this is question about um, I I am interested in applying for a course. Uh, it's under ODID. I was wondering, uh, like, are the I know that the lectures don't happen at the college. So like, do they happen at like the ODID building? They do, right? Yes, they do. Okay. Um, and also, uh, there was this one question I had about like the college uh preferences um if for example i put like that i have no college preference and they allot me a college uh and like can i change it later no no okay and like are there any tips for like sort of navigating like what to pick like how do you sort of okay. yeah 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 I think relatedly, we've had a bunch of questions on on picking a college, even in chat. So, if there if uh you are if there are any scholarships so which you get considered if you pick a specific college or if there's any recommendation for uh colleges to pick so you're uh, selected or any other guidance um on just sort of what to what to select in that option if you all could sort of respond to that. Yeah, let's do this one by one. Each of us can explain how we chose our colleges and then also add some more um, insights and guidance that we have gathered over the years. Let's start with Narita. Yeah, so uh, colleges, I think, um there are a lot of things that you can consider you could also if there is a specific college you have in mind then i would recommend for the course that you are applying for a lot of people look at the fellows and the kind of um, the uh, specific courses that the colleges offers because uh, your college will be providing you with a lot of resources over the period of time and uh, apart from that uh, yeah scholarships is a big consideration when you're choosing a college because there are a lot of college specific uh, scholarships and funding opportunities so that might be a good thing to look at and yeah this is it Shivanki. hi so i did not know much about what an oxford college is when i made my application so what i did was i first read through to understand what a college is then I made a list of my priorities of what I want my college to have, put it on Excel, and then I went on each of the colleges that offer my course. And then at the end, the college that offered all, not all, obviously, most of those priorities of mine, I chose that college. Specifically about my college now, I was at Green Templeton College, which is a very medical-focused college, and I did a very medical-focused degree. I did a very, like, cancer research kind of a degree and one of our college's um, early principals has had has done breakthrough cancer research so I like that we have a journal club society that meets up every week for you know academic journal um, readings and all I like that and one of our college fellow is um, also in the area that I did my master's in so I thought that maybe if I do get into this college, when my course allots me an academic mentor, which is supposed to be from your college, I might end up with this person. And that actually did work out for me. So that's how I chose my college. I think just to mention that it's not necessary that you, even if you do give a preference for the college, it's not necessary that you will get the exact same college. So that is something to keep in mind. 
है ना yeah so i think most of the things have been already pointed but my speaking from my personal experience i picked my college purely based on uh, this knowledge that my supervisor uh, also was placed the same college so she essentially has her office in the college which kind of makes easier for me to meet her uh, occasionally uh, purely uh, for the reasons of convenience but the other factor that now i think one could have really considered was uh, first is uh, also because some of the houses one of the uh, largest undergrad uh, libraries so libraries could be one certain libraries have i mean as college members you have access to certain libraries specifically college libraries so that accounts for one thing the other is certain internal bursaries and funding some colleges have more money than others so time to time you might want to apply for travel grant other special projects grant so these are uh, kind of channelized or Uh, put in one particular college, which might proportionately be greater than other colleges. So look at that. All of these things will be available on the website. Uh, third is the I think the community, the sense of community and the certain societies that you might want to be a part of, which might be at one college, and then a sense of community. So for instance, at Somerville we had the India uh, Center. So uh, that is that is one factor. The uh, one of uh, i think also accommodation is one thing that we might want to consider uh, because uh, essentially as students when we are enrolled at colleges uh, we do also get accommodations in those colleges most of the time not always but that there's a chance that you will be housed at one of the accommodations in the colleges so you could uh, possibly look up look at different accommodations that are available in the colleges and um, yeah maybe uh, cohort if you want to look at the cohort sometimes uh, most of the students at a particular college could be from the masters uh, some of the colleges could be undergrad oriented uh, sometimes refill oriented so that's one of the factors that you might possibly uh, also keep would want to keep in mind uh, yeah that's it mega i'm not sure if i'm the best person to speak about colleges and funding uh, because uh i got an external funding and so it wasn't a consideration when i was picking the college and i know that that is something that sh- is the driving force of selecting a specific college but i uh, for me i didn't i i'm at the same college at sana and i didn't pick that i picked another college uh, which has more options for tra- like travel grants and has more funding opportunities available for students internally um but yeah i i didn't get that college and now i'm at um uh, somerville college which i i do think is a really good college so um i i also think that you shouldn't spend too much time researching colleges and and picking that if while you're working on your applications if you're eligible for a scholarship uh, even if you haven't picked that college you get considered and your application sort of moves around so even for example if somerville has the india center you don't have to pick some of it to be considered for that scholarship your app, your department nominates you and then the college the center evaluates your application so um so similarly for all of those bigger scholarships that are housed in a certain college um you don't get selected to those or you're not considered if you pick that college but it's it it works on the basis of your, the application that you submit so yeah don't don't stress too much about um, colleges and don't spend too much time researching this while you have other things like your application to prepare yeah absolutely so uh, generally colleges don't matter for graduate students because most of the things that you will do as a graduate student will be with your department but these are additional things that you might keep in mind you will all get a college irrespective of you know whether you submit a preference or whatever preference you submit everybody will get a college and all colleges have like a basic level of support that they offer so don't worry that you know you you did as as member said don't spend too much time on this point but the additional things that sana shivanki and and that it mentioned are things that you might consider if you want to just you know go a little deeper into which colleges to choose um now there is the a to z scholarships tool scholarship search tool on the university website if you go on there and check for your course it will tell you what all colleges are offering specific scholarships for that course and th- then you will see if the 
colleges require or sort of expect you to mention uh, them as the first preference or your preferred college, um, unless that is the that's a requirement for a specific um, uh, funding option, you will automatically be considered for all the scholarships that um, that you are eligible for. Um, otherwise, accommodation, your supervisor's college, um, you know, whether it's a graduate only college or, an, or, a, or a mixed college um, uh, and, and also funding, travel grants and all of those things are factors that you take into account. And based on all of this, um, some of the colleges that I would recommend uh, subject to, of course, whether your college whether your course is offered by that college or not. If it's not offered by that college, then it doesn't apply. But some of the colleges that I would um, I would recommend are Modlin College, Balliol College, um, Somerville College, University College, uh, uh, Lineker College, Green Templeton College, St. John's, of course. St. John's is one of the richest colleges at Oxford, so you get a lot of grants, technology grants and whatever. Um, so that, but because it's the richest college and everybody knows it, everybody applies to that college and most people don't get in. Um, so these are some of the colleges, but I, then there are some colleges that are graduate only colleges, right? So St. Anthony's, Green Templeton College that Shivanki is at, Lineker College, um, uh, Wolfson, Wolfson. Uh, is a graduate only college. Nuffield. Lineker um, is also a graduate only college. Yeah, Lineker only. Uh, Lineker is also a graduate only college. So all of these are um, graduate only colleges, which basically means that there are no undergrads. So the vibe is completely different uh, because Oxford colleges are generally, um, you know, they revolve around undergrads. So undergrads are the main sort of life and blood of of these colleges because for undergrads, their college matters because they study at their college. Graduate students, we study at our departments, undergrads study at their colleges. Therefore, if there are undergrads in your college, your college is going to be a lot different than if it's a graduate only college. So um, you might, some people prefer graduate only colleges. If if you have a family or you know, you're coming with your spouse or some are dependent, GTC is a really good college because they have really good family accommodation, um, right? So all of these things are factors that you might um, keep in mind. Exeter is also a good college. The only problem with Exeter is that its graduate accommodation is slightly far away from the center. It's like a 25 minute walk. Otherwise it's also a good college. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I noted down like everything. Um, there was just another small question. It was, a, it was about LOR. Uh, so basically, um, there was this organization, you know, that it's based in US. And they do like student exchange programs for like students in the US. And they had like this one program that was like based in like India, Nepal. And like, um, so they were expect uh, accepting like uh, scholarships, for, like two students from India. Um, and like, I, I applied to that and uh, like, but I didn't uh, get it because um, uh, credits are not transferable. Uh, uh, to my university but instead they said that uh, like they sort of told me that we are doing like uh, so the program is based on sort of uh, Nepal but they do excursions in India so they, they said that okay you can join us for a one week uh, excursion uh, in South India and and I went this year in February and it was like it, it, although it was like really short it was like really you know it was very impactful for me so I was wondering like uh, if it'd be okay if I could ask the academic director of that uh, program to you know furnish with me with LOR like uh, is it like sort of would it, would it suffice uh, I would say that would not recommend that because for uh, letters of recommendation, it's advisable that you uh, provide LORs from people who have had the chance to actually work with you or observe you over an extended period of time. So because this was, I think, uh, as you mentioned, it was a one week exertion. I don't think it's advisable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Uh, okay, so that's basically all I have for questions. Thank you so much. Okay, there are lots of questions on LOR, so I'm just going to ask them. I've just clubbed what 
whatever I could find in chat that related to uh, letters of recommendation. So uh, maybe I'll ask them and you can just quickly, everyone can just answer each of them. So uh, the first is, um, if 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 my uh, NOR is is submitted and has a gra grammatical mistake, would that affect my application? No, don't worry. It it reflects not on you but on your. <laughs> no worry, no. It, it if there are small errors, grammatical errors, or you know spelling mistakes, those are always excused. Okay. Uh, second is, uh, can the same set of professors write your LOR for different courses that you're applying for at Oxford? And would that in any way uh, impact the assessment negatively? Yeah, they can write it for different courses. It does not impact your application in any way. Great. Um, so uh, the Oxford uh, application requires you to submit, have two of your LORs submitted uh with the deadline but one can be submitted later so um how late can that be submitted and uh, if it's sent later um does it impact your um, application you so even though it does mention that you know in the application the, the department can start assessing your application after you submit the two references you should always and always submit all three. It should be like an exceptional circumstance in which you're not able to, or your referee is not able to submit um, uh, the final reference by the deadline. Now, um, when should you, when should they submit it? If they are not able to submit it, let's say today, if today is the deadline, they should submit it tomorrow. If not tomorrow, then day after, like as soon as possible, because uh, once the deadline is over, what happens is that all the applications are collected, the admissions team sort of sorts through application criteria, blah, blah, blah. And then there is an admission team that starts looking at those, those applications. Uh, and there are different meetings that happen. And if you don't make it by that meeting, you will never know when that meeting happens, right? In some cases, it can happen within a week. In some cases, it can happen in two weeks. So if you don't, if your application, full application does not make it by that meeting you are risking your chances um so try and get that submitted as soon as possible if you miss the final deadline great um so someone is asking that do all three of your recommendations have to be academic uh, especially if you're someone who has quite a few years of work experience uh i think every course like when you on the website when you have pages for different courses they will mention the kind of references they would prefer for that particular application uh, for courses in humanities and social sciences they do prefer academic uh, lors they also give you an option to provide for one professional lor but uh, in that case you have to make sure that your lor is actually relevant to the course that you are studying and it it is relevant to you know your thesis or let's say the point you're trying to make in your sop but uh, yeah, I think it would be mentioned on the course uh, page, what kind of LOS would they prefer? And relatedly, if the course says three academic, but you have a few number of uh, years working, can you list a fourth um, a recommendation or like a referee who will be able to speak about your work? If, if the portal allows you to do that, go ahead, um, have a fourth reference, but uh, if the portal doesn't, then make sure you fulfill the the basic requirements that the course has. If they are asking for three academic, go for three academic references in the very least. And then of course you can supplement your application if the portal does allow. In some cases, the portal does not allow. In some, it does. It really depends on the course that you are applying to. Great, thank you. Um, second, the not second. I don't know which number this is, but um, is it okay if the um referee doesn't have an institutional email ID, um, or is not associated with any institution at all? So, 
I can answer the first part of the question because I've had a similar experience. I wouldn't really know about the second part. But if they do not have an institutional ID, uh, so I got in when this was the same case with me because my supervisor who was supposed to write my reference had retired. So she ineffectively she did not have an institutional ID and I mailed uh, the admissions team raising this issue and they said they asked me, they wanted to know why uh, does the referee not have an institutional ID because they said it's preferred that uh, the mail comes from or the references is uploaded through an institutional ID. I gave the reason and uh, they thought that the reason was legitimate since she's no longer an institutional member and therefore did not have access. And therefore, my supervisor did, or she was able to upload uh, the reference through her Gmail hotmail. She had a hotmail uh, domain. Uh, she, she was, so there has to be some genuine reason and you can really talk this out with the admissions team and they'll be able to help you. Um, so maybe just get in touch with them once and it should be okay uh, if the if the reason is, is legit. Uh, I, I don't know the second part. Um, someone will have to take that up, the second part of the question. Yeah, I, I can do that. So I mean, to add to what Sana said, right? You are you want to give yourself the best shot. The best shot is to do what they prefer. It is always preferred that you get it from an institutional ID. So do everything that is in your control to make sure that it goes from an institutional ID. Now there will be obviously circumstances, exceptional ones, for example, the, the one that Sana described, where you just can't, like it's just not possible because they don't have an institutional ID, in which case you can reach out to admissions team, but also make sure that the reference letter itself, like the professor, um, in the letter, specify why they are not submitting it from an institutional ID. Uh, they have to. So, for example, in, in Sana's case, they would have mentioned that they taught Sana when Sana was, um, uh, let's say, a graduate student at this university where she was the professor, right? And that she has since retired. Therefore, she does not have access to it. So the professor should also, in addition to you perhaps explaining it to the admissions team, the professor should write a line or two about why they are not able to either, you know, have a letterhead, official letterhead, or um, have the uh, the reference um, uploaded from an institutional ID. Um, yeah, always make sure that it is included in the reference letter. That's it. This was the second part of the question. No, Ms. Bhatt? Sorry, then a final question on LOS is, uh, is there any word limit that they need to stick to? Again, I think it's there is a page on the website which uh, lists down, which, is, which says information for referees. So I think it mentions about 500 to 1,000 words. That's the sort of uh, rough word limit they uh, give you. But you can also look at that page and maybe forward it to whoever is giving you your reference that might be helpful. And uh, yeah. sorry, I feel like I have a lot to say, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking a lot. Um, so th this word limit is obviously indicative, right? Um, it is always and always better if your letter of recommendation is detailed and specific. Now, um, I have seen reference letters where the professor talks about themselves, like, you know, I've done this, I'm a professor, I've been teaching for 15 years, I've done published in XYZ for one paragraph, one long paragraph. And then they write a couple of paragraphs about the student, uh, that yes, great student, please let them in. Now, if you were to take that word limit, let's say if it is 800 words and 400 words, the professor has talked about himself or herself, not really helpful, right? So when you are reading the, sorry, when you are talking to your professors about reference letters, make sure that it is substantively about you, your work, your ability to do this course, your ability to do academic uh, work, your ability to sustain in an academic setting, the rigor of the course that you have undergone and all of those things that show why you are a good fit for the course as opposed to, you know, what their own standing is. So generally, have a you know one and a half two page lor provided it is more about you than the professor i honestly like i've seen some where it is more about the professor saying how great they are and how their world should matter a lot more um uh, yeah okay um i think that's it on lors um and again just on the professional and academic ones 
please have a look at the course website and very clearly say whether they prefer uh, more academic or more professional. And if they say that it's recommended that it's academic means that more of your, of your three, two should be academic and one can be professional. Uh, so again, please go through the course website and see what it says in the how to apply section on the documents that you have to submit. Um, um, Ashwarya, do you want to ask your question now? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question was about the Masters in Public Policy course. Um, on the website, it says that it's um, it's conducted by the Blavatnik School of Government, and there are a bunch of co colleges that offer it. So uh, because at least within India, this is not something that I'm used to a course by a certain kind of a, a body and then multiple colleges providing it. So I wanted to understand how do I go about making a decision on which college to choose from and uh, what does what does Blavatnik uh, School of Government itself mean uh, in this in this whole environment? Right. So all graduate courses at Oxford are offered by respective departments, right? So the MPP at Oxford is offered by the Blavatnik School of Government, which is a department within the university. So everything, your classes, your faculty, everything, all academic related stuff will be at the Blavatnik School of Government, will be managed, taught, organized, everything by that. And every student at Oxford is a member of a college as well. That's just for your you know, social life, your personal life, for meals, for accommodation, or all of those things. And there are colleges that have a specific focus in that the community that they have, they want that community to be of a particular background. So some courses, some colleges would prefer that they have expertise in STEM related courses. For example, as Shivanki mentioned, GTC is a is more of a medical sciences uh, college. That's not to say that there won't be MPP students at GTC. There will be. If, if they are accepting students from different courses, there will be. But they have a particular focus. So some colleges limit the courses that they will accept students from in order to, in a sense, manage the community that they have and the expertise that they want to have. Um, it is only for those, those reasons and other capacity reasons that some colleges, you know, will take you and some colleges won't in that they will offer the course and they won't. Um, but for you, for all graduate students, not just MPP students, for all graduate students, it is the department that matters in that the department will offer the course and you will just be a student in, in a different college. So for example, on the MPP, the 140 students that are there, they are all studying together at the Blavatnik School of Government, and then they are all associated with different colleges. And um, I'm, I am obviously not an expert on Harry Potter, but um, if, if that was an example, it is, I think, the halls or whatever you are a part of, and then there is a common university where you go. It's just like that, you know, for your halls of residence, for your meals, for your social life that you have your college for, everything else is managed by the department. Sure, thank you, thank you, that it's clear. Ms. but there are a range of courses in DMs. Can we take those? They've been there for a while. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so one question is, when considering the MSc in Global Governance and Diplomacy, do you think it is advisable to gain experience in an international setting? I've been involved in work within local and state governments, and I'm certain about the best approach for my SOP in this context. Um, so it, it is not necessary that you have any uh, work experience in an international setting for the MSc in Global Governance and Diplomacy. Um, you will see that the students on the program um, come from different backgrounds, obviously, but some of them don't have any work experience at all, let alone, you know, international um, work experience or like work experience in an international setting. It is more about how the program is academically of interest to you. And even though it is about global governance, it's about governance more generally. So if you have worked within local and state governments, that should also be 
um, relevant and valuable work experience for you to uh, to mention in your statement of purpose or personal statement. Um, there is no expectation that you will have work experience um, in an international setting before. Um, okay, I hope that helps. And then there is the, this question, I haven't appeared for IELTS yet. Is it advisable to upload it at a later stage, the English language test? Who wants to go for it? Um, you can upload it later. As I said, that uh, the Oxford application portal does allow you to ask for a waiver. So you can submit your application without the English test result and wait for an offer and see what it says. Is it advisable to list leadership experiences held during my undergraduate degree within the application? If yes, should I list this under the employment experience section? I don't think uh, you're talking about college societies and stuff. I don't think that ha that can be listed under employment section. That will be a part of your extracurriculars, not employment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, regarding the SOP, my course page says, you may use the assessment criteria below as section headings. Some prompts follow, such as commitment to studies, reasons for selecting the department, etc. If I follow this, there is a break in flow in the essay. It is not really in a storytelling form, format. Is that fine? Um, now, so for example, it really depends from you know course to course and what their expectations are. Uh, the MPP expectation is that you answer like this year onwards is that you answer it in the form of those four prompts as opposed to you know one common story that just um, overall demonstrates your commitment to public service and public policy and all of those things. This year, they want specific answers to those uh, specific prompts, in which case that is how you should go about it. But if they say, if, you know, for example, the question here, you may use the assessment criteria below as section headings, it's up to you. If you think that that is, helping you make the strongest possible case for yourself through that personal statement, then use them. If you think um, you know, those sections are breaking the flow and you're not able to uh, demonstrate as strongly as you would otherwise why you're a good fit for the course and everything else, then it's not needed. Um, it, it's just some guidance that you can use. You don't necessarily need to do that. For the section on qualifications and experiences and then publications, preprints, presentation and performances, is it advisable to declare research? I'm sorry, this has already been answered. Um, will my last year's reference letters work? So this is a question related to MPP. Yes, they will. Things haven't changed in terms of you know the assessment criteria. The criteria still remains the same. It's just how you structure your documents uh, both your personal statement as well as the written work for the MPP that have like those those structures have changed. Otherwise, the admissions criteria and assessment criteria those things have not changed. But uh, yeah, you might still want your reference letter to be updated, right? Because it will be dated. Um, your refer referee must have put like last year's date um, on it. So the least that you should do is to get it updated and you know, reflect the the most contemporary um, and um, date. So that would be sometime like, you know, December, 2023, as opposed to December, 2022. To what extent do grades matter for MA and MPhil admissions? At Oxford, I have an overall 3.1 out of four GPA in my BA and MA. Okay, I think. Yeah, this is the question. Who wants to? Maybe we can all chip in. Shivanki, then Sana, and then Narete. Samir, could you rephrase the question, please? Sorry. Yes. To what extent do grades matter for MA, MPhil admissions at Oxford? I have an overall of, and that just doesn't matter, but like they're saying that they have an overall of 3.1 out of 4 GPA in their BA and in their <coughs> MA. Bless you. 
Thank you. So first, um, I think 3.1 out of 4 is not bad. It is good enough to apply. So as long as you have maybe done some extracurriculars or some relevant internships at your home institution or outside, that would add on to your application. Um, and be sure to list all of them. Mention how they were relevant or perhaps why you took them up. And I think grades are somewhat important, but they're not the only thing that would help you get into Oxford. It is also more about, or at least in my specific case, it was also about, like I said, the internships that I took that were relevant, directly relevant to my course, and they really helped me. So that's what I have to say. Sana? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, for us, uh... I think grade is the first first filter because uh, many of the courses in their eligibility section require you to attain a particular grade or about that, right? It's clearly mentioned on uh, the course websites. It will vary from course to course, but but there is there is a given standard on each uh, course page website. Uh, so so that is first, and uh, second, I think grade that way grade becomes important because it acts as a first filter and. Uh, I cannot really say about this grade because I do not know the conversion, etc. But but it is fairly important, I think, also the scholarships because it definitely helps helps filter. Uh, having said that, uh, if you do uh, get the required grade or above it, then uh, there are other things that are also important, as uh, as has been just mentioned. So other things also count in like your extracurricular, etc. But uh, it definitely is the first first filter, I think. Uh, and then Samir, of course, will expand on it. There is some obviousness to it, but personality. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, had the same points as Shivanki. Like, uh, the basic eligibility criteria, if you're qualifying it, then that's good enough to go. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if there is something that's lacking in your grades, but you have a profile uh, wherein you've done a couple of internships or you've been involved in other things, so that also makes up for that uh, lack over there. But uh, yeah, I mean, grade is important, but obviously it's not the only thing. Yeah, and Oxford is not a monolithic um, institution, right? So for some courses, grades matter the most. For others, they don't matter as much as they matter for the first category, right? So it also depends on the course that you're applying to. Some courses are just too demanding from a grades point of view. And no matter what else you have done, you might be the world's best, whatever. If you don't have those grades, you just won't get in, right? Uh, but for other courses, there are ways in which your application is um, assessed in that you know your grades are not everything as, uh, as Shivan can mentioned. But one thing that is common across all courses at Oxford is that they focus primarily on your academics, right? Um, now, academics is a broader concept than just grades. So in academics, your internships, relevant internships, your, um, you know, uh, if any publications um, and other experiences that are academic in nature will also contribute to demonstrating your academic potential your grades are the first thing that demonstrate that. It's the most basic thing that demonstrates your academic potential. But then you will be, as Shivanki, for example, mentioned, your internships, through your internships, you'll also be able to demonstrate your academic potential. So focus on, grades are grades, right? You have a 3.1, you have a 3.1. It's not something that you can change anymore, right? In your application, focus on how this grade, whatever grade you have, for you it's 3.1, for someone else it will be 3.2, 3.8 or something, whatever grade you have and other things that contribute to showing your academic potential and academic ability, try and focus on those things, right? And that will um, hopefully uh, make your application stronger because your grades are your grades and you're not going to be able to change them um, now. Um, while applying, there is a section that requires to provide skill or interest and give a brief description in 200 characters. Any 
suggestion on what should we include in that section to support our application? Mishra? Sorry, can you repeat the question? While applying, there is a section that requires you to provide skills or interests and give a brief description in 200 characters. Any suggestion on what should we include in that section to support our application? Um, I would say all of the things that you've not been able to mention in your um, uh, statement of purpose or things that you feel your LOR would not have reflected, but you think is still important to help in um, and in being evidence to your interest in the course, your work experience that would uh, make you a good candidate for the course. So all of those are that are very relevant to your course is what I would say you should write. So for example, and I wouldn't say writing very generic skills. So for example, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't suggest competency in like MS, like Microsoft Office apps, like Word and PowerPoint and Excel. All of those things are not skills that you should ideally mention there, but skills that are very specific that actually may have required you to uh, undergo some training. If you if you know some coding, if you know R and you know other softwares or any other modules, or if if you have very specialized training or no have speci very specified skills, uh, I would recommend mentioning those, which you think will supplement all of the things that you've said in your SOP and supplement whatever you might have given as evidence in your writing sample. Um, so. Um, so, sorry, to add to that, um, one, of course, you know, mention the most relevant things if you haven't been able to mention those before. And let's say if you are a, a humanities student and you want to uh, work on, you know, Egyptology, right? Then if you have experience of something related to Egyptology, mention that there. Let's say if your program, if your course requires you it would be, let's say, if it would be nice if you were to have the language skills in a particular historic language. Mention that. So whatever is the most relevant thing that you haven't been able to add so far in your application, mention that. So that's one. The other way to go about, if you have already, you know, included all the additional, sorry, all the relevant things, mention something that is interesting about you, right? Maybe you are a basketball national level player and you haven't been able to mention it anywhere else in your application, either in your personal statement or in the application portal. Mention that because then it will show that, okay, in addition to everything, you know, from an academic point of view that makes you a great candidate, you're also someone who is good at sports. So, or maybe, you know, you are, you're, you're someone who, you're a poet and you have published poetry or something. So two ways to go about it. Relevant, if you have included everything relevant, then I would say write something that is interesting about you. And yes, by, by interesting, I don't mean to say, you know, um, content writing skills um, or, you know, painting generally as a skill. Don't don't mention such generic things or like, you know, as Milpa said, MS Word, uh, MS Office, all of those things are basic. Yeah. Um, are those all in your DM? Uh, in, no, no. Now there are more questions in chat. I haven't seen my DMs in a bit. Okay, I can. Uh, so I'll take a few that have been pending for a while. Uh, that were in chat. So one is about. Uh, uh, this is a PhD query. So some they had reached out to their supervisor last year, uh, a potential supervisor, and they'd agreed that they they'd be happy to support that project. But they, when they applied, they didn't get an offer. So this year they've again reached out to the, a set of professors, but they've not responded. Uh, would it? Uh, would you recommend still applying even if you've not heard back from the supervisors who? last year had said they'd be interested. Sana, maybe you can take this, this first is, and then some. This is a very tough question uh, because, so uh, one of the things that they mentioned on the website is that even after you reach out to a potential supervisor and they agree to supervise you, does not automatically mean that you will get the offer, right? Because even then the, the committee will sit and evaluate your proposal, etc. Uh, so that's not a guarantee even if the supervisor reverts back to you, one. The second is in the subsequent year that you're trying to apply, 
uh, you've not heard back from the supervisors. Uh, now, there could be multiple reasons for that. Uh, not really going into the detail. Uh, but again, the website mentions that if you're not required to reach out to a supervisor, or it will say that despite reaching out to a supervisor, or you know, if you've not heard back from them, uh, you're not required to hear back from them. You, regardless, your uh, application will be assessed. Uh, all the applications are basically assessed by a committee. Now, with DFIL, what happens is that because it is a project, it is very important for interest to overlap. There should be a particular taker of your project, right, in the committee or in the in the department, in the faculty where you apply, because uh, it is very unlikely that a person working on something which is very specific to say project A or something which they've been working all life will diverge to take up a project which does not really uh, ring. Uh, with the kind of focus that they've had all their lives. So it's very unlikely that such divergence will happen, and therefore it's important and advisable that uh, you reach out, you have a particular taker. But uh, regardless, I mean, that should not really stop you from calling a shot and maybe trying out and see if, if it works, but, but there's no guarantee the ways. Yeah. I mean, do you have anything else? <laughs> no. Not really. Just apply regardless because there can be um, a number of reasons why this person has not responded. They are probably busy with something, their inbox is flooded, or a number of reasons. And anyway, regardless, as Sana said, your application will be assessed by a committee. If they think there is someone in the department, they will give you an offer. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, again, a few on uh, LORs. First is, is it Prefer if it, is it preferred that the LOR is digitally signed? Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay. Then, uh, is it okay if all three of the referees speak to uh, the same thing that you've been doing in the past year to as evidence? I don't know to maybe perhaps a gap here or just of whatever work you've been involved in? I would, I mean, you, you would ideally want there to be a diversity of things that, you know, uh, that they attest to, right? If the same person says, yes, this person worked on this project, excellent person, second uh, refer referee says the same thing, third referee says the same thing, yes, it makes it clear that you've done quite well on that, but it also the you know does not give them the opportunity, it does not give admissions committee the opportunity to hear about other things in your application from your referees. I would ideally have my referees talk about different things um, in my application. Of course, there will be some overlap, especially about academics. Um, there will be an overlap. And if you're not able to avoid this overlap where you know everybody has to talk about the same thing, make them talk about that thing from the, their own perspective. And there will be three different people writing from three different perspectives. Maybe, you know, if it's a research project, someone can talk about the design of the research, right? Like the methodology, et cetera. So the methodological aspect of it. Another person can talk about, you know, your field work or whatever it was. And maybe another person can talk about how um, your recommendations or how well it was taken and received by relevant stakeholders and so on and so forth. But ideally, different things. Uh, and just to follow up, yes, LORs have to be signed. Uh, they can't just uh, have their name on it. Uh, it, it unfortunately, it's very important that they be signed by whoever is writing it as a proof that they were the ones who signed it. Uh, then another question related to LORs is, um, my LOR is just 161 words, but it's fairly crisp and impactful. Is that okay or is that too short? 161 words can never be impactful. Um, especially if it is a reference letter for a graduate course. Your graduate admissions committee wants evidence, right, uh, from your supervisor of things that you have done, things that they can back you up on, um, and all of those things. I would, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to um, get your professor to write a slightly longer um, reference letter. 
also because uh, last year uh, as per last year a lot of courses this uh, word limit for sop was 1000 words but starting this year the sop they for a few courses they've just reduced it down to 500 a maximum of 500 words so i think your lors are a good way you can use it in a good way to highlight aspects about your application because 500 words for an sop is anyway very tight so lors could be a good way to highlight different aspects yes agreed and uh, i think a follow up question to the signature is that i've already uploaded it's already been uploaded and not signed so it's not going to be a problem it won't be a problem ideally it should be signed but because it comes from you know your institution of your professor's institutional id and they would have written their name at the bottom that is fine ideally it, it is you know it advisable that you have their signature on on the document whether a digital signature or a handwritten signature and then you know scanned and uploaded um if you haven't done that don't worry it will still be considered uh there are times when the admissions committee will feel that they need more information from you in which case they will reach out to you if they think that okay this referee they are a little skeptical about that uh, reference or they think they want to confirm whether your referee has actually written it then they will be in touch with you about that um yeah okay um so just on uh, another question on timeline for scholarship there are at least two questions that relate to this uh, one is that if you want to apply for scholarships that require you to have an offer from oxford before march which is when they usually give offers what do you do um, and then second is uh no i think second is related to the same So what just what does the timeline look like, especially if you have external scholarships? Um, I can have a go. Uh, if there is a scholarship that requires an offer from Oxford, and that offer, you know, by a particular time, and Oxford does not give you that offer, there is not much that you can do. But you can write to the admissions team and. Um, you know explain your circumstances and tell them that you are applying for this course and that the sorry this scholarship and that scholarship requires an offer and if they could expedite your decision uh, that would be great something like that but there are very few um such uh, scholarships that will um require an offer before oxford's that you know decision making uh it it happens with commonwealth which but but that's a november thing not really a, a march thing except for commonwealth there aren't too many scholarships that will require an offer beforehand inlax does but by that time inlax uh, by the time of inlax everybody has an offer from oxford okay that yeah. is helpful to know um Okay, I'm just trying to see if I've missed anything, and then we can go to the people who raised there, their there hands. Are, there are some. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have received an award from Academic Excellence, not from my university, but a local government community organization that awards students who have scored um, well in light of hardships faced. Is it advisable to declare this? You should definitely mention this either on your CV or somewhere in your SOP. It's a good thing. It it speaks to you know your ability to uh, persevere in light of hardships and do well academically it's it's great um ms you have already answered this but i would like to just add a little bit in chat um but for those who are trying for internal scholarships that do not require sep separate applications like felix clarendon is there anything that you can do to try and make your application stand out or do we just hope for the best generally hope for the best but um for for clarendon specifically um it primarily depends on your um you, you know so the score that you get while your application is being assessed um and that is primarily a score driven by your academics so remember when we were talking about our grades enough um i would highly highly recommend that you focus more on your academic experiences in your application because that is going to 
give you a good sort of score on your academic potential and academic ability. And then the department may consider um, you for a nomination to the university. Um, so just to say that you can't do much about it except to highlight your academic aspects of, of the profile in case you are interested in the Clarendon Scholarship. Okay. Um, are you going to read more questions? Yes. Are Oxford results revealed generally before the announcement of scholarships like NLAX, or is it advisable to apply to other colleges? You should regardless apply, you know, as a backup to other colleges, um, especially those uh, that do not have an application fee. Um, and uh, if you're already applying to Oxford, always have a backup because uh, you never know what works and what doesn't. Um, is it advisable to email professors for MPhil and MRes courses regarding research areas? Um, John, please. Um, in my department, there was an MRes course, and I know a few people who had reached out to their potential supervisors, and I think it is a good idea to do so because you you get a better chance at understanding what that PI actually does as opposed to what's already available online. You can maybe talk to them on a call or exchange a few emails. That would also give you a better idea of whether or not you are actually interested in that area of research. So I think it's a good idea. That doesn't guarantee admission again, like we had discussed yeah. earlier. Yeah, It's purely for yourself. Do I have to wait till March for my application assessment as my course at a 20 December deadline? Um, not sorry. necessarily for your, sorry, yes, go on. No, I'm just saying that there was a clarification to this and we've addressed this so we can move on to the next question. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, in a DPhil studentship um, program, how long do you have to be at the institution? Is it for the entire duration of the program? Um, two ways to answer this from a scholarship point and from a DPhil point. Now, uh, DPhils are generally three to four year programs at Oxford, depending on what department you're in. Um, and there is a minimum residency requirement, uh, which basically means that there is a set number of terms that you have to be in residence in Oxford while you are doing the PhD. Um, and once the residency requirement is fulfilled, you can do your PhD from wherever you want to. And it also depends on your arrangement with your uh, supervisor and also you know, the kind of work that you are doing. If your PhD is more field focused, in which case, irrespective of your residence requirements, if you're doing field work, that is already you, know, you working on your PhD, so you don't need to be in Oxford. That's one. Now, the second aspect of it is scholarships. Um, most scholarships for PhD programs cover just the period of the fee liability. So if the official duration of the course is three years, then the scholarship will only cover three years. So if, or if the official duration is four years, the scholarship will cover only four years. And there is generally no extension. Generally, there are, of course, you know, ways in which you can apply for extended funding. Uh, but generally your funding will stop at the end of the official duration of your course. Um, in which case, once again, you know, whether you stay in Oxford after that or not is up to you. Um, it also depends on a number of um, other circumstances. Yeah. Should we take the questions that Oh, should we take Sazina's question and then Amina? But they've had their hands raised for a while. Uh, there is, I mean, this question is in chat. So let's answer that question. And if Amina has something else, they can raise their hand. The course that I'm planning to apply shows deadline of December 1st, but there is still a green dot um, there. And they have written below that they will notify one week before closing. So that one week, uh, now will only be after holidays and on Jan 2nd, um, right? Um, so you, uh, there are sometimes courses um, that also, that continue to accept uh, applications even after the deadline. If they haven't, let's say, received enough number of 
applications or for whatever reason, if they decide that you have to you know, extend the number of places or whatever it is. Um, if they, I mean, they, they'll generally say this, that, you know, there will be, you will get a notice of one week um, before the application uh, closes. But one week is one week from the date, not, you know, one working week. So uh, don't think that it was only one week after 2nd January, uh, which is when uh, the university reopens, but it is one week from today. Um, uh, and if you check it tomorrow and the green dot is still there and they say that, you know, one week's notice, it's one week from tomorrow. So whenever you are checking it, one week applies from that point of time till then. The applications go to the departmental admissions committee or uh, is there a central admissions team for DPhil in Oxford who look at the application and then forward the shortlisted ones to the department? Uh, no, the, each department looks at um, the respective PhD applications. There is no central body. If I have two good professional LORs rather than academic, is it okay if I submit two professional and one academic? Um, so sorry, has this already been answered? Yeah, so it's already been answered, but always, 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 um, you know, you sort of err on the side of academic references. Uh, we can probably take uh, Sazina's question and then go ahead with the chat once again. Yeah, so hi everyone. So I have three questions very particular to my application. Am I audible? Yes, you are. So the first question is, um, in terms of the, do you have any uh, professional qualifications and training courses to report? As it has been said in the meeting that uh, those courses who are not been assigned to a particular university, uh, which is like only courses are needed, so we should not mention that. Uh, that being said, uh, I am I have done a course uh, from so like it is from uh, an online uh, portal only but it has been associated with the Yale University but I have not been assigned any uh, certificates on that so is uh, so if I have uh, see if, if I have paid for that course I would have got a an a certificate but I didn't so I don't have any certifications on that so should I upload that and uh, uh, proceeding to that one course is from MIT and I'm doing that online only, but I, I I have not completed that course. So I do not have any certification still now. So should I mention those two courses? Uh, I mean, based on what we said earlier, um, you know, it's not just about whether the course is offered by a university. It's also like there are MOOCs, like massive online open courses and courses like that on Coursera, edX and such platforms that universities just leave there. So it's not really professional qualification or it's, it's not really training. It is just, you know, making content available for people to, uh, to enhance their knowledge and, and skills. So it's not really training as such. I wouldn't mention it there, but I would use it in my application somewhere to demonstrate my interest in that particular area, especially if I did not have anything else. So like these online courses, courses that you do on Coursera, edX, et cetera, those are, you know, fillers, final things that help you demonstrate that I've done so much, but I've also done this, right? Like just to enhance or, you know, demonstrate your interest in, in that course. But shortly, there will be more important things that you have done in your undergrad. There will be internships. There will be other things that you have done that demonstrate your primary interest in the course. I would focus more on them and less on these um, uh, Coursera and other online courses. Um, but if there wasn't anything, then I would obviously mention um, these as well. Because it, it's, it's a question of prioritizing your experiences and things that you have. So you know, create like a list. I have these 10 things overall that I have done. Number eight is Coursera. If you've already listed first seven things, 
then there's no need to mention the eight thing. But if you think that your Coursera is number four in that priority list, then do mention it. Okay, so it is uh, advisable to mention that in the SOP, right? So I will I will be mentioning that in my YouTube because I have like a lot of things, so. Yeah, I mean, once again, in your SOP, you want to highlight something that, you know, what's it like concretely demonstrates your interest in something, right? So you would want to highlight maybe a work experience, a research um, internship or something else. So unless you think that Coursera is that one thing that demonstrates your interest the most, I would focus on other things, even in your SOP. So it's mostly about the priority list. Okay, yes. so I got thank yeah. you so much. Thank yeah. you much. Yeah. My second question is about, so how do we make a second application to the University of Oxford? As in, as in terms of LSE and Imperial, they mentioned in the portal only that uh, there will only be one application and we can provide uh, courses in terms of preference, but Oxford doesn't do that. So how do we apply for a second course? Like, do we uh, create an entirely new application from the same user ID or password? Uh, or do we have to like change the password and user ID as well? Something, I don't know how to create an yeah. application. So, so what you do is once you create your account, right? Uh, you will obviously start from some course. Let's say if you're applying for the MPP, you will start from MPP, create that course. So that will be the first application that's there. And then if you want to, let's say, apply to the, MPhil in Development Studies, you go to the MPhil in Development Studies page, click on Apply Now, and it will create a new application with the same username and password. So your username and password, your profile will remain the same, but there will be two separate applications now that you can fill independently. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. My, my third and last question is about the funding part of my application. So my course, which is MSc in Mathematical Sciences, this course particularly uh, does not offer the Weidenfeld Hoffman Scholarship, but in the funding section of my application, uh, it has mentioned that uh, Weidenfeld Hoffman Scholarship and Leadership Program. So if like, I want to provide a supporting statement on that, but as I know that it is not an eligible course in that scholarship, so should I just ignore the point because it is not so? Yeah. Okay, and and the funding and in the funding section as well so there are six funding uh, uh, scholarships that are mentioned and for all of the six i am not eligible as ahrc dtc and dtp i think those are for doctoral uh, programs and uh, and there are some others as well hill is not applicable and islamic studies and all that so uh, all in all i am not uh, eligible for all the scholarships that that are that require an additional statement so, uh, so uh, will I be considered eligible uh, uh, automatically for the scholarships or all the scholarships? So, like, I, so I, I don't have the opportunity to, to provide any additional uh, statements for any of the scholarships. So, the scholarship that I, uh, I have, uh, I will be eligible. That is something which I will be automatically considered. So that is that all? Yeah. Or do I have to like check on the website? No, that, that that's all. You don't need to do anything. So the, the the ones that require separate statements are listed there. If you are not eligible, then you ignore them. You will automatically be considered for anything else. And you, just like everyone else who will be applying to Oxford, will not have the opportunity to say something else, right? Add an additional document as a part of your um, sort of scholarship or funding application. So you're all equally, uh, or you know, um, you're all in the, same sort of circumstances uh, from that point of view. Don't feel that you are, uh, you know, people who will fill those three things or Weidenfeld, Hoffman, et cetera, will be at an advantage. They will not be. That part will only be looked at for the WHT and your application will be considered for all other eligible things. I just wanted to mention one little bit about the DTP, the AHRC DTP. Sometimes um, these, uh, Sometimes these programs, these scholarship programs, fund the two plus two program. So even when you are applying for a master, let's say if you're applying for the MPhil in development studies and want to do a DPhil in development studies at the same, I mean, one after the other, then you are sometimes eligible for the research council scholarships as a two plus two program. So two years of your MPhil, 
and two years of your refill and put together four years of funding. So you might want to just have a look at whether your course is a part of that two plus two. Your course will mention it in the funding fees and funding section. Yeah, so my only doubt was that because Hoffman and Verinted Scholarship uh, eligible courses um, does not state that uh, MSc in Mathematical Sciences is, is an eligible course. So why is it mentioned in my funding section? Is it like that, a it, No, it's not. It's there for everybody. You first have to check whether you are eligible. Only if you are eligible do you apply. So it's not like a mistake or anything. But I, was, I wasn't talking about Weidenfeld Hoffman. If, yeah. if your course is not you know, eligible for Weidenfeld Hoffman, you just ignore that. I was talking about the AHRC, the Research Council Scholarships. If sometimes there are courses, especially MPhil programs, that are also eligible for funding under that program from a um, from a two plus two, uh, uh, you know, uh, funding uh, arrangement. So just have a look at your course and go to the funding fees and funding page. It will mention whether it is eligible for that two plus two program. If it is, then you can make an application irrespective of um, the fact that you are applying for an MPhil as opposed to a DPhil. Okay, I got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, Saberi. Uh, hi, uh, I put this question on the chat also. So basically, um, my course has, my chosen course has post requirements stated in the application. So it's asking for um, commit, for the SOP, it's asking for commitment to graduate studies in evidence-based social intervention. And it's asking for motivation for the proposed area of study. So could you maybe explain what the difference between the two is? So is it for the evidence-based social intervention and policy evaluation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then um, let me quickly have a look at the website and see what these two components are. We can take other questions in the meantime. Um, I don't know how many people are still on the call from those who asked questions beforehand. So let's say if your question hasn't been answered, can you put it in chat again so I know that you're still on the call? Uh, so there's a question that come up uh, that came up. I've run into a tech issue while filling in the application on the portal in the about you tab. I accidentally clicked on the previous country of residence drop down option, even though it's not relevant to me. I was able to leave it blank after I realized I made a mistake. But every time I save and proceed to the next section, it shows across next to about you tab and highlights it in red. Will this stop me from submitting my application when all the tabs are filled? Do I need to contact someone in the tech team at Oxford? Contact the mm -hmm. team as soon as possible. For all tech related issues, like as soon as possible, the moment you encounter an issue, just email. Because later on, they won't be able to accept your application. Uh, application If you tell them, you know, there was a tech related issue and that's why you were not able to submit by the deadline. So, um, so was the question that uh, your statement of purpose or personal statement, it mentions that it will be assessed for commitment to graduate studies in evidence-based social intervention and policy evaluation, and then reasons for selecting the department and motivation for an understanding of the purpose of, um, sorry, of the proposed area of study. Um, and how do you, how do you go about that? was key I was a bit confused about the difference between commitment to the uh, uh, commitment to the department and motivation for selecting the department it, 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 I mean it, it says that you know this will be assessed for commitment to graduate studies in evidence-based social intervention and policy evaluation 
And the other point is motivation for and understanding of the proposed area of study. And these are two different things from how I read them. So one is your commitment to, you know, uh, studies in evidence-based social intervention. So you can use your experiences, et cetera, to show how you are committed to doing evidence-based social intervention kind of work. Right, so that's one. Uh, it is commitment to that kind of uh, study. Then it is motivation for an understanding of the proposed area of study. Now, of course, there is some overlap, but your proposed area of study could be, let's say, poverty alleviation. Right, in which case the motivation for that can be different from your commitment to to propose to to graduate studies in evidence based courses. Does that make sense? Uh, so basically, the the third uh, the for, like motivation is the specialization that I would like to pursue. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. That's really helpful. Thank you. So we. Do you have any more questions you want to take? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm getting there. Uh, the essays they require. Um, would it be better to submit the one theme with policy issues, or would an essay specifically on law and legal issues be equally helpful? Um. So this year onwards. No, a general sort of essay on law and legal issues or policy issues will not be helpful at all. This year, they have specifically, you know, asked for, um, let me quickly read out what it is. Um, and, and I mean, this is the guidance that the MPP web says. The reflective policy essay has been designed for us to learn more about your experience with real world policy challenges as well as your ability to learn from mistakes and to problem solve. This written work will enable us to understand more about the professional and personal experiences that have shaped your public service passion and to, un to um, understand better what you might bring to the MPP classroom. We are looking for essays that tackle policy um, or uh, policy implementation problems that you have experienced. Um, we do not want a generic theoretical public policy essay so it has to be on a particular issue like this year they have given a prompt a clear set of prompts for you to to respond to um i hope that that is helpful um there is one question is it advisable to mention volunteer experience in personal statement um yes yes it is Um, then I am adding references to my SOP and written work. Should I use Oxford referencing style or can I just put a superscript and add the links of references in the footnote of the page? Um, you will need to check what reference um, style um, or guidelines your department has mentioned. In fact, like there is a link on the how to apply page, but generally a uniform style of citation is fine. You don't need to, you know, um, you, you don't need to, uh, con sort of conform to a particular style. Just whatever style you choose, make sure that is uniform throughout uh, the document that you um, submit. At what um, point- Sorry, Samir, can I uh, yeah. just pause you for a second? And the session has been going on for almost two hours, no? So, so that's a really long time for our panelists to be sitting here. So if any of you have to drop off, um, it's completely fine, you don't have to stay um, uh, for the- whole entirety of while um, questions are being answered. So, yeah, because uh, I, I feel like there's quite a few DMs that Samir has. It might take some time. So, yes, if you have to hop off, it's completely fine. But if you're happy to stick around, that, that's also fine. Yes, Ms. Bain, I will at least stay until all the questions have been answered. 
um, but man, of course Shivanki, Sana, Narita, but also everybody else who is on the call, feel free to sort of drop off whenever uh, you want to. And thank you, Shivanki, Sana, and Narita already. Um, if you are, if you just drop off, you know, in in the middle of the call. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna yeah. go because I have another meeting. So if there is if that there aren't any questions that are pending from my side, so I'll take off. Okay, thank you. See you guys. Thank you so much, Narita. Thank you for joining us. Bye. I think I will make a move as well. I need to be somewhere else, but thanks for having me. And if there are any questions specifically for me, I'll be happy to happy to get on to them later on through the team. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Shivanki. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Go ahead, Sunny. Okay. Um, yeah. How rigid are the disciplinary boundaries for courses that welcome students from any discipline? Say, if someone from a STEM background is applying to for an MPhil in social anthropology, uh, with the courses explicitly stating that no previous training is required. Um, Ms. Ba, this is an interdisciplinary course related question. You want to take it? Sorry, can you repeat that? How rigid are the disciplinary boundaries for courses that welcome students from any discipline? Uh, I mean, I don't know. It, it really depends on, uh, I mean, if they've mentioned that it's interdisciplinary and they meant they welcome people from any background, then I guess um, it really doesn't matter which academic background you come from as long as you're able to show that you want to that you are a good fit for that study and how your interests align with what the course is offering. Um, so for example, I did the master's in women's gender and sexuality studies and it, it's housed within the humanities division, but it's an interdisciplinary course. Um, and um, and so in that, we we I had one of my classmates was from computer science, one was a graf graphic designer and one was, um, and quite a few from law so um, so they do take people from different backgrounds but it it but you should also see whether you will be benefiting from what the course has to offer because then a lot of because it was in the humanities you sh um, a lot of the people weren't really happy with what the outcome was because they felt it was very theoretical and, and didn't really help them so again you need to see whether you're actually getting what the course offers so just don't go for it because you know say it's Oxford but actually see whether the course is offering um, um, all of the things that you actually need so look at the handbook that's on the website look at the course modules and look at the professors on the course and see whether it's actually going to benefit you Um, um, I think there was there's a question about Mastercard, and I think there was another there was another one, uh, but more generally on just making payments for Oxford applications or any application abroad. Just ensure that online trans international transaction is enabled on your card, uh, and uh, if you feel like you may have an issue, then just speak to your bank once beforehand to let them know you're making an international transaction. But usually, you can do it through the app, where you can enable interna international transactions and i think you can do it by a mastercard again for all of those who are on the call if there's if you put a question in chat um, and it wasn't answered uh, can you please post it again on the main chat so he has DMs, he can answer that. I mean, the DMs that I've received, I'm answering them um, on chat. Um, those are very specific to, to those individuals.
Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, at what point do we submit certificates for our volunteer internships? You don't have to submit your certificates for your Oxford application anywhere. Um, is the word count counted in the footnotes of bibliography in the writing sample? Uh, no, it's usually written on the post website where you where it lists writing sample. It'll tell you whether footnotes or bibliography are included in the fourth footnote or not. So please have a look at the course website and see what it says there because all of this is um, clearly stated. I, I don't think there are any questions. Um, my course requires me to submit a sample of written work, one essay of 2000 words, and I'm a journalist and have published long form articles. They are relevant to my course as well. Can I submit such an article? Um, I would guess that you can, again, um, see what the course expects you to submit as a writing sample if it needs to be relevant to the work that you want to do on if, if your master's has a thesis component or if it's a PhD then see whether it needs to be related to what you want to do um, so again I, I'd say yes that would work as long as you know it it has a, it can it's a formal academic piece but um, but um, but yeah, that I don't see why you can't submit that. Yeah. So um, on um on that is what um in this question um you know having published long form articles now if they are relevant as in you know they are relevant in terms of the content that's one thing but whether they are appropriate for the written work is different as Ms. Ba said. Like they should be as academic as possible, and the course um, page will mention what they will be assessed for. So check what they will be assessed for. If what they will be assessed for are like your, you know, your ability to make an argument, your ability to, to you know, think critically, your ability to synthesize existing literature, your ability to engage with scholarly literature. In which case, it will you will need to change your long form journalistic article to a more um, academic sort of essay. Um, because um, although it is like relevant from a thematic point of view, it is not really uh, an academic piece. And Oxford would highly, highly um, sort of um, expect or demand an academic piece from you. Natisha? Yeah, uh, so this is for the MSc in uh, evidence-based policy course. Uh, so the essay says, uh, I mean, the right, uh, the, uh, either like statement of purpose or personal statement, right? Uh, from what I understood, there are different ways, uh, like statement of purpose is more academic and uh, personal statement is more like a personal story you want to uh, apply for this course so here it's given like state sop slash personal statement so how do we like uh should we focus more on academic only or how to approach this um so it, it doesn't really matter what the heading is what matters is what is written there in the description so um, from the description it looks like it's more of a statement of purpose than a person statement because it says that you know the the statement should explain your motivation for applying for the course and its specific focus on evidence-based social intervention and your experience in education and specific areas that interest you or you intend to specialize in so it's more of a statement of purpose um than than uh, a person statement 
all right all right thank you and also for yeah. the writing sample can uh, so can we uh, submit pre uh, excer- excerpts from our dissertation i mean is that relevant or should we like write a new sample uh, uh, work all to all over again um you you can you can use um you know excerpts from um a longer let's say dissertation but you will then need to contextualize it when you are like write a note at the top to say that this forms a part of a longer piece and is like a small excerpt on this part of the dissertation or thesis and um make sure that it is like that the part that you are sort of abstracting from a long, longer piece make sure uh, that it independently fulfills the the requirements of the written work that are there all right thank you thank you so much yeah. um, is it sorry, advisable Samir, to um so mira yeah. have to head as well i think you can take the remaining questions that are coming there are just two chat. questions and then i think we can also end i have answered all my dm questions on chat should we, will you wait for like just one minute um is it advisable to add links to dissertation link links of dissertation to personal statement you can um uh, it's not a problem but anyway it will be there in the um in your cv or on the portal so there is no need to as such if you just make a reference to it that should be enough um what kind of information is suitable to include in this section other information is there anything else you would like us to know um this could include particular achievements and also factors which may have affected your level of opportunity which you have not included in ex, um extenuating circumstances section and as, as i mentioned like you can use um that information that sort of that section to include information about achievements that you haven't mentioned before or circumstances that you haven't been able to to list before for example you know um in your degree if there was one semester in which you did not score too well because you were unwell so you could mention something like that um or if there is a gap here if there is a gap in your cv maybe you can could use this space to to mention that but also to you know list other achievements that you have been mentioned there as i said like you know if you have used all your academic work in the, the documents you can just add um your achievements um sorry not achievement like yeah your non academic related achievements in that section i think that's it um i mean i uh, just to answer i know she's still on the call but it's not advisable to add a link of your dissertation to your personal statement okay i think that's it thank you so much everyone for joining us today uh, all the best for your app oxford applications um and yeah thank you samir for joining us all right bye everyone merry bye. christmas bye.